Um, where we're at is a proposed sale. Pretty much everything right behind us is one of the units of the Red Hill timber sale. Bark has been involved in the Red Hill timber sale for about a year now. Uh, the Mount Hood National Forest put forth a, a collaborative group, a group of interested individuals, uh, to look at doing a restoration proposal up in Mount Hood. And Bark, we, we, our motto is to restore and protect Mount Hood, so restoration sounded pretty good. Um, so when we came initially, there was about 3,000 acres of uh, timber proposed to be caught up here. And so when we first looked at that, there was a few red flags that really jumped out at us. Um, the first thing that came out was it was 450 acres of uh, habitat improvement. These were 110-year-old stands that had never been logged before that they wanted to go in and thin out a bit and create snags, which basically means kill live trees, in order to create, in order to create habitat for, um, for woodpeckers and uh, particularly pine martens. Um, so that seemed a little bit alarming to us to be going in there and doing... Um, uh, doing that kind of work, logging in native forests uh, for habitat. Generally, when you leave these forests alone, there's competition that happens. And some of those trees get shaded out, and they die. And they, get, um, they get fungus in them. They get bugs in them. Woodpeckers start pecking on them. It creates cavities, and that creates habitat. So if we leave that natural process alone, we get habitat in time. Usually what happens is when you create a snag or you create a standing dead tree, you girdle the tree, so you create a ring about six inches all the way across the tree, which it effectively kills the tree, but you don't have fungus in there and you don't have bugs that get in there, so it, it makes it not habitat until that process occurs. And then where you create that girdle, where you create that line, is it often creates a weak spot in the tree and that tree is more susceptible to fall. So we were able to present that, that case to, to, um, to the Hood River Ranger District and that portion of the sale was dropped. The other proportion was a uh, huckleberry enhancement. And this was way up the ridge, way up, um, up towards, the, um, towards the trailhead up ahead on 1650. And what they wanted to do was thin the forest to 30%. So basically, like looking around here, they would take out seven, 10 trees and thin those out so that the huckleberries and the understory would unfortunately respond to that and, um, and thrive and flourish and produce more berries. So that was a little bit more complicated because there are indigenous treaty rights where Native Americans, uh, Mountain National Forest has to provide huckleberry habitat for Native Americans. But when we were looking on the map, we saw that this was on the top of the ridge, about 6,000 feet. The adjacent ridge over is ironically called Blowdown Ridge. So blowdown is when trees, high wind storms, it fall down, right? So where this huckleberry enhancement was happening was high up on the top of the ridge. And when you, when you thin the forest about 30%, taking away 70% of the trees, the wind's gonna rip through there much quicker. Um, and if you lose all the forest on an exposed ridge, it's gonna be much harder for the, uh, the forest to recover in those areas. So we made a counter proposal to try and get some of these plantations opened up as uh, huckleberry enhancement instead. And so that's still on the table and we'll see how that, what comes of that um, when the environmental assessment comes out. Sometimes huckleberries just reach a point where they're not as productive and so burning them off they will come back from that root crown, so it doesn't kill them completely. So it just kind of rejuvenates the plants. Yeah. And so sometimes without that rejuvenation, you just don't get that. And when you thin a forest for huckleberry habitat, generally what they found is um, it's not that many years later that the canopy closes again. And so the huckleberries have to contend with, you know, the compacted soils and things like that, but they're not getting that long-term boom. Um, if you were going to do something like that, it would probably, in the interest of huckleberries, it would probably look like falling trees, um, you know, some dude out there with a chainsaw or what have you, and then maybe burning the areas. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, again, we're, we're getting those fires that are happening naturally up there. So hopefully that's getting the huckleberries to, to respond well. I've been standing here for 800 years. And if I had me some eyes, So 
So for now, um, we have no environmental assessment. We're in the scoping period of this sale. Um, and basically what that means, the scoping period, is a point in time in which the Forest Service just sends out a map and maybe a two-page letter that says, somewhere in this area, we're going to do this and that. And there's not a lot of details. And I think this is a really great place if you're new to BARC or if you're new to the work we do, um, a really great place to enter into these projects. Because during the scope period, when you want to be involved in public lands management, you don't have to have the answers, right? All you have to do is be curious and add, ask really good questions. Because what the scoping period allows is for the public to come out and see what they're proposing and to ask questions. When the environmental assessment comes, um, but before we kind of get into trees and ecology, um, like I said earlier, we also need to talk about what is happening in this area. Um, because when we talk about the ecology of trees, we talk about the stories that they have to tell. But a big part of that story is uh, the human impacts on the lands too. And um, that's why I kind of brought you here today. Um, where we're at is a proposal out. That's what comes out after the scoping period. And this is a 100 to a 200 page document. And that gets that goes to the nitty gritty. That's all the details that list the environmental effects of logging in this area. So when that comes out, the game changes a little bit. Then you're going back and saying, well, I don't believe with this claim, or you should read this science study. It's different than what you say. And so it gets a little bit more fine tuned. But at this point in time, we just have to ask really good questions. So that's kind of what we'll be doing today when we walk throughout this area, just kind of um, looking around and imagining what it would look like if they would log and kind of think how that would change the ecosystem. And since we're talking about conifers, we'll kind of couch it in that today too. How will those trees be affected? You know, would they respond favorable to that? Could they suffer from that? There's trades off in any, any activity that we do. So we'd like to explore some of those concepts today too.